Hi, I'm Patrick Krupka. I'm a chiropractor, I'm a nutritionist, and I run a functional medicine-based practice here in Houston, Texas. On today's video, I'm teaching about what the female menstrual cycle would look like if you were to graph it out on paper. It's a question I ask my patients quite a bit when we're dealing with hormonal complaints. I ask them, how well do you understand what goes on from day one to day 28 when you're having a cycle, which hormones are active at what times, and what those hormones are supposed to do. Invariably, there's a lot of confusion about what's supposed to be happening. So I wanted to take a minute, make a video, and help everybody out. So first, let me orient you to the graph that I have here. Obviously, it's an empty graph at this point. Day one, day 14, day 28, we're just discussing a, what would be a normal 28-day cycle. I'm well aware that cycles can range, you know, 24, 25, 26 days, all the way up into 30, 31 days, and still be considered normal. I'm just picking kind of an average 28-day cycle to go over here. Um, I'm going to use blue for estrogen, red for progesterone. Uh, you can see I've got the days marked. First half is follicular, second half is luteal. You've got days on the bottom, hormone levels on the side. Okay, so let's go. Let's talk about what happens. So first of all, when you're counting the days of a cycle, day one is the first day of your period. Now, sometimes you'll spot for a day or so a little bit, but then you'll actually start having a period. That counts as day one. All the other days are based on that being day one. Day 14 should be mid-cycle. Numerically, it will be. That should be around when ovulation occurs. It's not always the case. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, what I'm going to talk about first is the way the hormones are laid out throughout the month, and then we'll talk about the actions that those hormones have on different tissues in the body. So starting at day one, I'm going to start with estrogen. During the follicular phase, estrogen should be the dominant hormone. Now, I'm going to have people comment on this telling me that, that what I'm drawing here is not absolutely accurate, and they're probably going to be right. This is going to be representative of what a cycle should be. If you were to look at this graphed out by the lab, which we do, we do through a lab called Diagnostex, um, D-I-A-G-N-O-S-T-E-C-H-S.com. Uh, they have a hormone panel called the Female Hormone Panel, or FHP, and that graphs all this out for you. That would look a little bit different, but this is going to be representative so you get the understanding. So on day one, estrogen is the dominant hormone and it typically comes up, kind of spikes before day 14, and then comes back down and is not the dominant hormone for the rest of the cycle. That's typically how estrogen is laid out during the month. Now, progesterone, progesterone is not the dominant hormone in the first half of the month, but then comes up and should be the dominant hormone in the second half of the month. Now, that's fairly accurate for what it should look like if you were to have this on a test. Now I'm going to point out that right in here around day 14, I know my lines are probably not straight, the pituitary does produce a couple of hormones, FSH and LH, that's follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone. We'll talk about those in just a second. So that's basically how the hormones are laid out throughout the cycle, not too complicated. Obviously, you have a biphasic cycle. There are two phases to the hormones. There's an estrogen-dominant phase, there's a progesterone-dominant phase. Those are called the follicular and luteal phases. Now, let's talk about why they're called that. I'm going to talk first about the effects these hormones have on the ovaries. Then we'll go back and talk about the effect that they have on the uterine lining. So ovaries first. Estrogen, when it comes up here to its pre-ovulatory peak, remember this is when ovulation should be happening, when we have that pre-ovulatory peak, what that's doing is it's sending a message to the ovary to choose a follicle that will release an egg that month. One of the follicles is a little more mature than the others, or it's out near the surface of the ovary, whatever the criteria is, that estrogen priming index, we call it, will get the ovary to be more reactive, get it ready for the follicle stimulating hormone, and get that follicle kind of primed and ready to release the egg. When the estrogen starts falling and progesterone starts rising, the pituitary, a little gland up here in your forehead, produces follicle-stimulating hormone. Now that tells that follicle to release the egg into the fallopian tube. So now you've got an empty follicle and you've got an egg going down the fallopian tube. At the same time, you've got the hormones crossing over. 
Once that follicle is empty, once it's released the egg, we, we change the name of it because we have to keep this confusing, right? So now it's called a corpus luteum. Luteinizing hormone is released from the pituitary and that tells that corpus luteum to reabsorb back into the ovary, okay? Uh, some authors say that if that reabsorption process doesn't work properly, that can promote the, the formation of ovarian cysts. Other people say that that's not what it is, but it's certainly one of the possibilities. So luteinizing hormones produced, estrogen's coming down, the egg has been released. Now, in the second half of the cycle, this progesterone is in preparation for an, a fertilized egg being implanted on the wall of the inside of the uterus. If that doesn't happen, then eventually the progesterone levels drop, you have a period, and the lining of the, of the uterus sloughs off, and that starts at day one again. So that's, that's what happens with the ovaries. Now let's talk for a minute about what happens in the uterus. Now in the uterus, as the estrogen level comes up like this, the uterine lining, or we call that endometrial tissue, or endometrial cells, that lining, the cells in it, start to proliferate. Quantitatively, you're making more and more and more cells as this estrogen influence continues. Now, once that estrogen influence drops off and progesterone takes over, you should stop making additional cells, and the cells that you already have start to mature. Now, over time, once those, once those cells mature to the right point, they will start to slough off and you'll have a period. Okay, so in the, in the uterus, the estrogen causes a proliferation of cells, the progesterone causes those, those cells to mature if an egg hasn't been implanted. If an egg's implanted, different hormones are released and that goes differently, that's not today's video. So that's basically what's supposed to happen. Now, a lot of times knowing this and understanding this, if we look at the symptoms that someone has around their period or even around mid-cycle, we can usually get a pretty good idea of what type of dysfunction we're talking about. Now, a lot of times women will say that they have cramping and bloating and tenderness, um, breast tenderness, moodiness, um, a sense of fullness or water retention, um, cramping that lasts up until the first day or two of of a fairly heavy period, they'll get clots, tissue, all of that. Many of you are probably nodding your heads right now. So first of all, none of that's normal. And now it's common, and it may be average, but that doesn't mean it's the way you're supposed to work. So I wouldn't call it normal. As we look at this, what is supposed to happen, we've already talked about, but what if estrogen continues to be dominant? What if this progesterone peak never really happens? What if progesterone just kind of ends up being lazy and droops along there and estrogen never really comes down? It stays higher longer. Then you're going to proliferate more and more and more cells in the lining of the uterus. That means there's a lot more to come out when you finally have your period. Now, when there's that much in there that needs to come out, your body kind of feels the need to have contractions to get that out. That's the cramping that you feel. And when you have clots and tissue coming out that, that's kind of obvious, that's because there's so much in there. Now it's normal to have a little bit of tissue or a clot here and there, depending on what you wear to manage your periods. But you should not have these large clots. I have women that report clots, you know, like the size of a golf ball. That's, that's inappropriate, right? Something's wrong. There's too much endometrial tissue at that point. So, so that tells us that you're probably estrogen dominant throughout the cycle. Another sign that, that there's estrogen dominant, progesterone tends to be a mood controlling hormone. If this progesterone level drops off early and leaves you uncovered for the last few days, you tend to get very moody for the last few days, right? People don't always wanna be around you then. They won't tell you you're moody because you're scary, but they don't wanna be around you. So that's, that's kind of what happens when you have estrogen dominant. If that occurs, your ovulation date may be, may be moved forward or backward. You may not ovulate. Some months you may ovulate, other months you may not. If you have ovarian cysts from prior cycles that didn't go well, sometimes you'll feel pinching and grabbing in that mid-cycle time frame when you should be ovulating, when that ovary would be active. If you only have those on one ovary, you may feel the pinching one month and not feel the pinching the next. In general, we think that the, that the cycle like this involves a different ovary each month, right? It cycles back and forth from right to left as the months go by. Now, nothing's perfect. 
right? You may, you know, use the same ovary two months in a row and then switch to the other. But in general, we tend to feel that the, that the monthly cycles are governed by alternate ovaries as you progress through the months. So you may have pinching one month if that's the ovary that has the ovarian cysts on it. The following month you may not. That's not uncommon. But the important part of all of this is to know that when you have symptoms like that, it, it doesn't have to be a mystery. There's a reason you have symptoms like that. And if you can figure out which organ or which gland is not doing its job appropriately and do what needs to be done to support that organ or gland, whether you need to get adjusted to give that organ or gland the nerve information it needs to process properly, whether you need to support the communication between the pituitary and the, and the ovaries and the uterus, uh, whether there's an adrenal problem that, that keeps you from making the precursors to estrogen and progesterone like you're supposed to. I mean, the list is long. Um, there can be nutritional deficiencies. Um, there can be structural issues like ovarian cysts, like endometriosis. There are lots of problems that can occur. But getting your hormone cycle balanced, in many cases, can be the very early stages of completely clearing up the problems that you have. Before you go adding more hormones to the system by getting on the birth control pill or something like that, you really might want to consider talking to a functional medicine doctor that understands a graph like this, can understand your symptoms in relation to this, and can help you figure out where your problems are and what an appropriate path is to correct that. So that's what I wanted you to know today. Please feel, feel free to leave comments below, ask questions below. We'll get a little bit of interaction going. Um, let me know if you've seen this before or if this is new to you. And feel free to share it with other people you think might benefit from the information. So thanks for watching today's video. There will be more to come. Until next time, eat for your health, train for performance, and live the life you love today.